Welcome to Apartment 309 Podcast, the one-sided storytelling podcast where I dive into true crime or the paranormal and tell it to my captive audience boyfriend while he reacts occasionally, basically just recording part of our normal day. I'm Lauren. And I'm Eric. And we live in In Apartment apartment 309. 309. So, it's been a minute since we recorded. We're back. Uh, Yeah, it's been a couple of weeks. I cut off my fingertip. I just started with that. Just, we're back. We're back. We're back. You got your finger. I got my finger. It's growing back. Everything's back. (laughs) There's a lot of blood. It's so gross, but it's starting to to grow back to its normal shape. Cut your fingertip off, didn't you? I did. Part of it. Some of it. I saw it on the cutting board. Ugh, God. Sorry. It was mixed in with the celery. Well, it's there. It's in the well, trash now. Actually. It's gone in the trash. There's something particularly gruesome about, like, just, you know, losing parts of your body in general. But when they're attached to things such as nails Ugh, God. or teeth or hair, yeah, it just gives them that extra little bit. I have that big old chunk of nail stuck to it. Yeah. Ugh. That was yeah. nice. It was so gross. <laughs> but we got it all bandaged up, and I realized we don't have, like, any actual first aid stuff in our house. Oof. I know. Don't tell them that. Dummies. If somebody had stabbed us, we would have died. Yeah. The first thing I do whenever I get stabbed is go for the first aid kit. Yeah. Get yourself, like, a little packet of gauze. Get the little mini gauze. Get the, like, the two-inch by two-inch piece of gauze. Get the Neo. (laughs) Put some Neosporin on it. Get some expired aspirin and some Neosporin. (laughs) Get, like, half of an aspirin from 1980. Yeah, you don't want an aspirin, right? That thins your blood. Oh, hey, that's a good point. So. Probably. That's how much I know about first aid. And I've taken these courses too. <laughs> but did you did you pay attention to them? At all? Yes, kind of a teacher's pet when it comes to a brown noser. Little classes, courses. L- little brown noser. Is that a baby crying? That's a baby in the background crying. No, that's just the ambiance that I carry with me. That's the that city ambiance. <laughs> Oh, and a dog barking. We couldn't get away with oh, good. just one without the other. Yeah, because that's like never happened. Yeah. Well, that's great. Great timing. Everybody knows what we're doing. They hate us. Because they ain't us. Because <laughs> they ain't us. Well, guess what? So, oh, ow. I'm in the closet and I just elbowed a bunch of clothes. There uh, you are. New podcast that I found uh, from our first episode, you know, Greg and Dana Newkirk, uh, with the Traveling Museum of Par- of the Paranormal and Occult. Yep, Greg and Dana. Yep, and they had the statue. Uh, shoot, what was it called? You had me repeat it like eight times. The crone. Something about a crone. Anyway, Greg and Dana actually have a podcast called the Haunted Objects Podcast, and it is fantastic. They are freaking hilarious. Yeah, they put on a I good show. Them. I yeah. like them over there. Yeah, I made you listen to them. We took a road trip last weekend and yeah put it on and it's great it's hilarious so if you guys haven't heard of it um and you think our podcast is decent definitely go check them out the haunted objects podcast yeah they're hilarious they're a hoot i like they're on the ground reporting and we have a new logo designed by eric he just finished it up tonight so i'll be posting it when i post this episode and he worked pretty hard on it i love it we're so back. Did a great job with it. We'll be posting it on Instagram as well. If you guys want to drop a comment, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Tell us what you think. Tell, tell us if you love it, hate it, engage. Mostly just tell us if you love it, though. Tell us if you hate it. No. We don't care, but it's engagement. Lauren cares. Yeah. Anyway, so just drop a comment. Let us know. Uh, that'll be going up uh, when this episode releases. I think this Friday, uh, the 1st. Yeah. That's the goal. That's we're, all I got. We're back. We're back. You know, did you hear there's a su- there's a super blue moon today? Is that today? That's today. It's the 30th. Yep. Yeah. It's super rare. It's two full moons in one month. They snuck another one in there. 
when I was in fifth grade, our teacher used to lose his temper all the time. <laughs> and uh, he's, we called him on it one time and he said, I lose my temper as often as there's a blue moon. And we're in fifth grade. This kid, Trevor, pipes up and he goes, there must be a lot of blue moons then. <laughs> <laughs> even the teacher's aide cracked up it That's was funny pretty good yeah fifth grade trevor i won't say your last name but i do remember it that would be every 33 months every 33 months or 2.7 years well he lost his temper every 33 hours it was hilarious <laughs> you know you cannot have a super blue moon wait no you can't have a blue moon in the month of february because there's only 28 days sometimes 29 Cannot squeeze one in oh, there. Oh, because there has to be 33 days in between them. And for it to be a blue moon, there has to be two in one month. Yes. Interesting. Two in one month for a blue moon. How Do you know how often they occur? Like, is it every 33 days there's a blue moon? You Wait, you said 33 months? 33 months. Every 2.7 I don't know what I'm talking years. about. Would you like to start over? <laughs> every 2.7 years or 33 months, there's a, su there's a blue moon. But this one's a super blue moon. What makes this one super? That it's a, f I don't know, something about its proximity. <laughs> it's a blue. <laughs> it's not actually blue. Why would they call it blue if it's not actually blue? I don't know. I'm kind of a straightforward kind of gal. I don't know why they call it blue moon. Huh. Maybe something to do with harvest or. A harvest moon is a harvest moon. And it's sure. usually red Maybe or Maybe something to do with said harvest, not same thing yeah but the reason they call it like it's red or orange is all the dust that kicks into the air all right whatever it's not blue well then it must be all the water that gets kicked into the air <laughs> turns <laughs> from volcanoes yep the but, honga tonga volcano did that yeah I, the, and it got it woo, it was so big it actually created its own weather system above it that was really crazy when you told me that yeah you could see it from space and at the time, like at its peak for how many times lightning was striking in that weather system at the absolute peak per minute, I think it was like, I can't remember, a couple Lots. thousand strikes of lightning per minute. And then um, it had 50% of the world's lightning at that time was happening in that storm. That's ridiculous. Which is insane. It was the, the unprecedented. They never, they, there was no way for them to predict how big it was it's bonkers it's enormous anyway that's why it's raining so much and all the mosquitoes are out they are ah they're aggressive too it's either that or it's bill gates it's the volcano or bill gates one or the other maybe it's both it's both it's both but they're the, awful this year this is <laughs> I got 20, bit on my this face. is 2023 remember the vibe it's both bill gates and a volcano the vibe is just yes Yes, it's, it's <laughs> happening. Whatever you think might be happening, it's probably is happening. Likely. And whatever you want to do, it's going to happen. Like right. you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Vibes of 2023. But that's yes. the only news I got for you. Nice. Well, today's story is about true crime. And it's about time for some true crime. Oh. Hey, yo. We've we're been back. going aliens. We've been going conspiracy theories and paranormal ghosts and demons. We're having it back around to true crime. We're back. And this is some fresh true crime. Oh, like, it's so fresh. The kind of true crime that I want to precursor this entire episode with the word alleged. Oh, it smells so good. The word? It's fresh. Oh, God. What? <laughs> Eat fresh. So today we are going to go up the coast of New York um, and we're going to fall down a rabbit hole of a corrupt DA a conspiratorial sheriff. There's violence, murder, and unfortunate deaths of se several young sex workers. Ooh. We've got facts, we've got speculation, and we've got an ongoing investigation. So let's get into the alleged Long Island serial killer. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to do. It's fun. Anyway, uh, to kick us off, uh, let's go over just a couple of the basics. We'll give you a quick rundown. Okay. On December 11th of 2010, four bodies were discovered along Ocean Parkway on Gilgo Beach in Long Island, New York. So it's the southeastern tip of the state of New York. Right. 
and it kind of it's the little dangler out in the ocean there at sure. the bottom. <laughs> the bodies belonged to four missing women from the surrounding areas that had disappeared between 2007 and 2010. Hmm. All had been sex workers, and all were desperately missed by their families. The local police department had opened a case as this was now being considered the dumping ground for at least one serial killer with a specific M.O. There were more bodies that had been found further away up the coastline in the years prior to the discovery of what was known as the Gilgo Four, but they were spread out within a three-mile uh, stretch of road. And as far as we know, they don't necessarily fit the same M.O., but they may have been from the same killer due to their proximity. Okay. One man has been charged with the murder of three of these victims, and he is currently being held behind bars where he has sat since his arrest this summer. Oh, boy. But in this episode, we are going to get to know some of the victims, and then we're going to go over some of the details of the case, because we are going to have a two-parter. <gasps> Another we're going to be back yet. Huh? We're coming back. We're coming back with the, another two parter. So, most of the background info that I found was on the Gilgo Four. Their cases were covered mo more recently, I guess, and more heavily. Okay. I think in a case like this, it's incredibly important to follow the victim stories and to show support for their families who lost a loved one in a violent and very untimely way. Right. Yeah, of um, course. So we're not even going to cover the alleged killer's name in this one. We are just going to focus on the victims and some of the police that did work on the case. Good. Forget that guy. Screw him. Also, we're probably going to cover him a lot in the next episode. But for right now, screw him. Screw him. Allegedly. All right. So... Let's get to know a couple of them that I found a lot of details on. First one is the girl who made the call that started it all, Shannon Gilbert. At age 23, Shannon Gilbert was a bright, young, aspiring actress and singer. She grew up in a less than dynamic household. Um, she ended up being removed and was put into foster care for a period while she was still very young, although she was returned to her mother and her three sisters. It's also not known who her father is. People have tried to dig into it. They've tried to figure out who it is. Nothing. We got nothing. She graduated early at the age of 16. She was smart. Uh, when I said she was bright, I meant it. She skipped a grade and graduated early. She moved to New Jersey with her boyfriend at the time in her search for fame. Um, she wanted to be a little bit closer to the city, see if she could make it big. She did get into the online escort industry to try to make money, pay the bills, even hiring a driver slash bodyguard to take her to appointments. So she was doing well for herself. Her driver slash bodyguard's name was Michael Pock. He took her on one last ride out to a gated community in Oak Beach, Long Island on May 1st of 2010. They arrived at 2 a.m. Pock waited in his car. She went into the home, you know, to meet her appointment. Sure. And then a little while later, she ran screaming from the home, screaming to anybody that would listen, they're trying to kill me. She called 911 oh. from her cell phone and kept telling the operator on the other end, they're trying to kill me, they're trying to kill me. The homeowner, who was paying for her services, Joseph Brewer, swore that he did not give her any drugs or attempt to harm her just that she became agitated at some point during their meeting and asked the driver, Pock, to help him calm her down. She bolted. She fled from the property, started knocking on neighbors' doors, begging them for help while still on the phone with the operator from 911. A couple of those neighbors actually called 911 themselves. They were woken up, went to go see what the issue was, and she just kept running from porch to porch. They didn't really go into detail if these people refused to let her in or what was going on with that. Um, I'm sure it was quite the scene. After 23 minutes, Shannon ended up disappearing into the marshes behind the community. So it backed up almost to the shoreline, and it was just this boggy marsh area between, like, beach, ocean, and shoreline. Hmm, okay. 
So 23 minutes, she was on the phone with 911, screaming, yelling for help, running through this neighborhood, and then the call drops. It would be over a year before her body was found in the marshes. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Next, we have the girl whose sister never gave up, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. At age 28, Maureen had two young children. She was doing her best to be a good mom. She worked hard, desperately trying to make enough to live on her own and support her small family. She was a single mom at the time. She didn't have a driver's license or a car, but that didn't stop her from looking for jobs that she could tackle anyway. Maureen finally saved up enough to get her own place with her kids, borrowing her sister Missy's computer occasionally to catch up on emails and keep searching for something better. Maureen called Missy on July 9th of 2007 to let her know there was a modeling gig in New York City. That was the last that her family heard from her. Maureen had taken a train into the city for a photo shoot to help promote herself on the back page of Craigslist. She was also working as a sex worker. She and a co-worker at the telemarketing job that she was working at during the day at the time had gone down together to get the photos taken and find some potential clients. Both women had been temporarily banned from Craigslist for their posts, and it took away their main source of online advertising for business. And that was a huge question that popped up later. If she wasn't finding clients on Craigslist, where was she finding clients? Her coworker didn't really answer that question, at least in the interviews I saw. I'm assuming she told the police what, what they were doing. But she did mention that Maureen had some regulars that would be expecting her. So she may have stayed in the city to, you know, communicate with them. Sure. The coworker decided to leave early and head back home, and that left Maureen by herself to make just a few more bucks before the end of the weekend. That was the last sighting of Maureen by those that knew her. Now, later heartbroken about the news that her sister had gotten into the sex work industry, Missy went into her laptop and logged into Maureen's emails and she found that Maureen had a very expensive custody battle for her son going on, and that was her youngest. She hadn't mentioned anything to Missy or their family. Um, she was dealing with it privately on her own, which was a huge financial drain on her. And then Maureen was also looking at being evicted from her tiny apartment, oh, um, man. not able to afford the rent. That's rough. Yeah. That's a that's a rock and a hard place if I ever saw one. Yeah. It would be three years before her remains were found about 20 feet off the side of Ocean Parkway near Gilgo Beach. She it would left be how long? Three years. Wow. Yeah. Next, we have the girl whose daughter never lost faith, Megan Waterman. Megan was 22 years old. She was a fashionista from Maine. She had one brother and four sisters. She was a loving and dedicated mother to her one daughter, Lily. Megan's boyfriend at the time, Akeem Cruz, was an abusive asshat of a human being. Megan's family had been trying to get her to leave him, but she was afraid for her life and for the life of her daughter. He, he truly was a physically, emotionally, mentally abusive man. What it, an asshat. Yeah, asshat. It's unclear the exact circumstances that surrounded this chain of events, but Akeem ended up forcing Megan into prostitution, acting as her pimp. On that final weekend, Megan left Lily with family. She followed Cruz to a Holiday Inn in, I think it's Hop Hog, New York. <laughs> Security cameras show Megan leaving the hotel on June 6th of 2010 at 1.30 a.m., she was walking down a back walkway on the hotel grounds along the building. This is the last that anyone would see her alive. Akeem alerted Megan's family that she was missing later that week. The police had already had their eye on him as a suspect given his previous track record, and they were also watching him because of what he was doing with Megan. That yeah, sounds was, like a top suspect. Yeah, a, a prime freaking dirt bag that might do this mm -hmm. um yeah so he was ruled out as a suspect after multiple interviews with the police which to me is weird being as he is the one that allegedly scheduled her dates for her and told her where she was going to be going um but had no information on this john as they call them this date 
that she was going on. Nothing. Interesting. Supposedly. Wow. Yeah. I would love to see the uh, the actual record of the interviews with him. Right. If they took them. <laughs> but we'll get into that next episode. It would be another year and a half before her remains were found off of Ocean Parkway. Next, we have the girl who was searching for success, Melissa Bartholomew. She was 24 years old. She graduated from high school in New, New York, moving on to become a hairdresser with dreams of her own salon. She'd gone to cosmetology school and was working at, I think, a Great Clips in her hometown, which is a small place. So she decided to move out to Bronx, New York, to help her get to the next level of being a glamorous stylist. She rented a basement apartment for $700 a month and found herself in a financial situation where working as an escort just made sense. Her neighbors and landlord remember her being a sweet person and a respectful tenant. She left behind eight cats in her apartment and them scratching and clawing and whining at the door actually alerted the others in the building that something was wrong and that she had never come home after a scheduled meet with a client. She had told her friend that she was going to meet them, not something where they communicated every day. It was a few days before anybody was able to to realize that she was missing. The morning of July 9th, 2009, Melissa deposited $900 into her bank account, sent a text to her, her younger sister, and then disappeared. Next, we have the girl who ran out of time, Amber Costello. Age 27, Amber struggled with addiction for years. At the age of six, she was the victim of assault from a neighbor, which led to her lifelong battle with heroin starting in her teens. She had been married twice, her, hu her first husband leaving her due to her addictions. She then moved to Florida for a few years, actively participating in a church there, struggling to get out of the sex worker profession and work through her addiction to heroin. She spent seven years out of the industry when she did go back in. Police looked up the registered address she shared with her second husband, Donald Costello. They found that it was the listed address for a company called Private Playmates Escort Referrals. It is believed that she had left the evening she disappeared to meet with a man who had been calling her repeatedly, several times, offering $1,500 for her services. Amber had spent years trying to get out of the game and get her life on a different track. But on September 2nd of 2010, her time ran out and her short life was taken from her abruptly. She would not be found until December of 2010. Oof. Each victim had a story, each victim had a family, and each victim deserves to be remembered. So I'm going to read the names of each of the alleged victims of the Long Island serial killer left on that fateful stretch of lonely oceanfront highway. Keep in mind, everything, again, is alleged. The investigation is literally in the middle of it right now. <laughs> First, we have Karen Vergata. She was 34 when she went missing on February 14th of 1996. We have Valerie Mack, age 20, when she went missing in 2000. Jessica Taylor age 20, missing July 21st of 2003. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, age 28, when she went missing on July 9th of 2007. Melissa Bartholomew, age 24, when she went missing on July 12th of 2009. Megan Waterman, age 22, when she went missing on June 6th of 2010. Amber Costello, age 27, when she went missing on September 2nd of 2010. Shannon Gilbert, age 23, when she went missing on May 1st of 2010. The next three are all unidentified. Uh, they had partial remains found in the area. The remains of an unidentified toddler were found. The unidentified mother of the toddler was found. She had some tattoos of peaches on her. They did testing and realized the two were related. The last was an unidentified male of Asian descent, also found in the area, who died of similar, under similar circumstances. 
All in the same area, huh? Is it, Are these all the people that you said were in within three miles? Within three miles, a majority of them were within like 500 feet of each other. That's crazy. Yep. So now I want to cover some moments that really just blew my mind. Uh, more details about the investigation, more details about the girls and what happened. Okay. Most of the girls were short and the media dubbed them petite. All of them were stunning, truly beautiful. Uh, a lot of them actually had headshots taken. You got to see their best angles. Most serial killers have a type, and this one had gone after brunettes, usually with hazel eyes. Most of them were actually under five feet tall. So three of the Gogo Four were 4'10", 4'11", and right around 100 pounds. There were a few exceptions, although it's still being investigated if this may have been a dumping ground for multiple killers. Some of the bodies were only partially recovered because some of them had their identifying features removed. Um, hands, feet, heads, etc. Uh, some of them were only identified within the last year thanks to new DNA testing options that they have. Regarding Melissa Bartholomew. So after her disappearance... Her 15-year-old sister that she had texted the night she went missing started getting harassing phone calls. On July 16th, 19th, and on the 23rd, an unknown male called from Melissa's phone, taunting the teenager, telling her that her sister was a bad person, a prostitute, and then detailed how he had murdered her and violated her to her 15-year-old sister. That is horrible. So apparently the calls had gotten extremely graphic, and each time the authorities, so they did alert the authorities, uh, who then tried to trace these calls. Each time the authorities were alerted that a call had come in, but their efforts to locate the caller had been thwarted. He would call from crowded locations like Times Square and Madison Square Garden. He kept the calls short so as not to be fully traced and even looking through camera footage at the locations to see if they could try to figure out who might have been on their phone at that time, there was too many people. They couldn't pinpoint who he might have been in the crowds. So they felt like it might have indicated that he had a, uh, a background in police work or um, criminal, criminal work. I'm blanking on what that's called. So he had an understanding of how to evade the yep, authorities. He Yep, he would keep them shorter than three minutes and stay in crowded places. So he knew how they would find him. Law enforcement, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> uh, so they questioned whether he might be part of law enforcement. Melissa's family hired a psychic later who was able to tell them that Melissa was in a shallow grave near the ocean in a place beginning with the letter G. That didn't really mean much without more of the details. And it turns out she was found on Gilgo Beach, wrapped in burlap, left hidden under the brush. So I don't know what else the psychic said, but they were they were square on with that one. Huh. When the bodies were found in the burlap, it took investigators a while to realize that the burlap was used as a form of camouflage. So it's hardy, it's breathable. It allowed for quicker de decomposition. So it kept them camouflaged, but it allowed them to decompose, unlike putting them in a plastic bag or something where there is no airflow. And many hunters actually use burlap to set up camps um, because it's so good at camouflaging. And it led some other investigators to believe that the sus suspect may be involved in construction or worked with access to construction sites to get the amount and the type of burlap that he used. Huh. That's interesting. Seems like a pretty smart, calculating person that knew what they were doing. Yes. And uh, just the, the Gilgo four were found with that burlap on them. The other ones weren't. So he kind of maybe refined his process or something. Possibly. Right. Because we're talking one of the bodies found in 96, and something that I should have mentioned at the beginning but didn't, all of them were strangled. Pattern. That's the pattern between them, and with the number of years in between the killings, he might have refined exactly what it is he wanted to do as a killer. Right. 
And that's why some of them, you know, and maybe he realized they weren't going to find the bodies or identify the bodies. They did find a couple of those bodies in there, you know, hikers just going back through the marshes. So the girls that were found later were all in one area. Um, and some of the other bodies were much further north. So it's like maybe he realized it's not that easy to find or not that easy to identify them and decided to go a different route with it instead of taking arm or hands and heads and stuff. Yeah, it's just amazing that somebody could dump a body so many times in the same location, essentially. The investigators that went out to the scene said it almost felt like somebody drove off the road like just pulled off the side of the road dumped the body out of the car shut the door and kept going that's how close to the road they were that's how hard just callous just done dumped and it took them that long to find those bodies yeah and it took them that long burlap man if you ever feel like you're in trouble for me you could just put yourself in a burlap sack and hide in the corner yeah, or turn the lights off or hide your glasses or <laughs> just stand in the Basically, corner facing the corner, not do looking at you. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't hide my glasses. That would be awful. Oh, that's my camouflage. <laughs> just stop moving. Yeah. She can't see us if there's no movement. Just like a T Rex. <laughs> All right. So. Police were called out the night Shannon went missing when all the 911 calls were made by her and the neighbors of her client. Her driver, Michael Pox, said that he tried to chase after her, but he lost sight of her in the marshes. So I'm wondering what these neighbors are witnessing. If she's running up onto their balconies, screaming, slamming on their doors, where's her driver, who's supposed to be her bodyguard? Like The absolute chaos that must have been happening. Neither Michael, the driver, nor her client, Joseph Brewer, were properly questioned ever in her disappearance. They were never formally, form, form, formally, formally, formally sat down and questioned. And it was assumed by everybody on. What are your plants, Lauren? No. It was assumed by everybody that was on scene and left behind kind of searching for her, trying to figure out what had happened, that she would just eventually turn back up. So they really didn't even try to look for her that much. Yeah, they they tried to look for her, but come on, you know. unfortunate. You hear that way too often, that it's like, you know, not enough importance put on missing people sometimes. I think especially when it comes down to missing people in the sex work industry, um, a lot of blame is put onto them. That's you know, it's like, hey, you willingly put yourself in a dangerous situation. Okay, and like you know, if somebody is bleeding out on the street, regardless of how they found themselves there, you try to stop the bleeding, right? Right. It doesn't matter who it is. That's that's what good people do. So why this is a missing person? Why wouldn't you go look for her? She was clearly in distress. Who can you can sit there and be like, ah, she was probably, you know, on drugs. Ah, she was probably in the it, okay, that's great. I love your opinion. Anyway, so this girl is missing <laughs> and we need to go find her. It it just it really bothers me that people are able to separate humans into categories of importance and stand by that just shamelessly. Right. Like, even if you have to turn and somebody asks you to look in the mirror and and explain yourself, you are still set. You've made up your mind. People can be categorized on levels of importance. It's depressing. (laughs) Did you have anything to say? Because I definitely just monologued on that. Not about that, no. Tell me I'm wrong, Eric. (laughs) Steal (laughs) my glasses and hold still. (laughs) You already know. (laughs) Oh, anyway. Um, One officer, thank goodness, Officer John, I think it's John Malia. I'm sorry, sir, if I'm saying your name wrong. I'm I'm trying. Officer Malia and his trained cadaver dog, Blue, went out and searched the area that she was last reported to have been seen. 
he searched it, it took him a month to get out there but he searched after she went missing one month that was a weird way to say that after a month of her missing he went out there and then he spent the entire summer of 2010 out in the marshes with blue looking for her he had okay, to I give think it up I know what you're saying now i don't know why that was so hard to explain <laughs> maybe i'll edit that down <laughs> Um, he did have to give it up at some point at the end of the summer, but then he picked it back up again in December of 2010. That's when Blue finally alerted Officer Malia, pointing out a possible body. Malia went and located the remains of a female, but was confused when it was wrapped in burlap and pretty severely decomposed. The body was about 25 feet from the highway, hidden under some brush, as if the driver had pulled off the side of the road and tossed the body out of the car before continuing on its way, like I said. Within 500 feet, another body was found. Then again, and again. None of them were Shannon, however, and these first four bodies were now called the Gilgo Four. Their families started a little support group together. As a task force was put together uh, to try to locate what was now clearly a serial killer. It's, what is it, more than two? I don't know. I hear things all the time about what actually is the designator. Um, I think that the main designator is at least three victims. So more than two. We've got four. It's now officially on the books as a serial killer. The families um, held, vigil, held vigils for their daughters. They set up memorials for each of the girls they supported each other as the news of a serial killer, you know, washed over the nation. Everybody wanted to talk to them. Everybody wanted interviews with them. And they were, you know, they had just flipped from having a, a missing family member to having a murdered family member. I can't even imagine what they were going through. Yeah, leave those people alone. I mean, everybody wants to know. It's... um. Since the 70s, I mean, how many times do serial killers come out? Right. We know they're there, but how many times are they truly acknowledged and dubbed? That's a serial killer. We found their victims. They're out there. I mean, people were, I'm assuming, panicking, especially in that area. 100%. It breaks my heart because, you know, they they just found out that their loved one was just tossed aside. That was a daughter, a mother, a sister, aunt, cousin. I mean, they just, in a, in a second, lost them forever. Yeah, that would be one of the toughest things. I mean, a couple of questions. Do they have any suspects? Who's in charge of the investigation? What's being done to keep girls from being ruthlessly murdered? Who's being targeted? What do we do to protect ourselves? And that is what we will cover in our next episode of this two-part series on the Long Island serial killer, allegedly. Allegedly. So um, there is uh, more information in the way of a, of a case. It's open and they've got a suspect. They right now do, and they have formally charged this suspect with three of the murders. Oh. And... I'm not saying his name. He doesn't get part of this podcast episode. Nope, we don't want him. He'll have part of the next one, but not this one. This one's for the girls. Good. Yep. Yeah, and they all sounded like pretty decent people, too. Yeah, I I think when you start to put it in perspective and you start to... It's kind of like a resume. When you can see all the amazing things that a person has done with their life in a way of you know presenting themselves to be judged... And you take that one thing off the table, or you give a reason why it's on the table, it's a lot easier to see who they were to their families. Right. Yeah, everybody's got a a background, you know? All the faces that you see around, everybody's got a story and a life. Yeah, everybody was a kid once. Yeah. You know, if they, they passed away as an adult, they, they were a child once. They were somebody's baby. Right. And, um, yeah. So that's that's all I wanted to focus on this episode of a blooming investigation. Yeah, allegedly, screw that guy. Yeah, that allegedly, poor. fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah, truly. Um, 
anyway, I, I hope the best for the families that are going, you know, getting dragged through the mud again. Um, I wish you all the best of luck and we'll be here to keep, keep updating. Yep, definitely. All right. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I got nothing. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight in apartment 309. Feel free to send us your story if you have any stories, true crime stories, things that happen to you. As you guys know, we love paranormal, we love aliens, and I love a good conspiracy. We're back. Tell us stories. It's the year of yes. So 2023. Is it a conspiracy? Yes. Is it a good story? Yes. Let (laughs) us know. Our email is apartment309podcast at gmail.com. You can always follow us on Instagram because I don't like Facebook and I'm not on TikTok and I don't care about anything else at apartment309podcast. Oh, snail mail. Love me some snail mail because I'm old. You can mail us at Solar Circle LLC, care of Apartment 309 Podcast, P.O. Box 631728, Highlands Ranch, Colorado, 80163. Please don't forget to rate and review. Uh, People are more prone to listen if they see a couple of stars under our name. If you know anybody that might like our podcast, don't be shy. Tell them about it. Go check out Greg and Dana Newkirk's podcast haunted objects and thanks thank you guys for listening we appreciate you we're back (laughs) the year of yes we're back thank you all right we hope you join myself lauren and eric next time in In apartment apartment 309. 309